I'm going to talk to you about balance, and balance is probably a little bit more of the complicated area of MS, only because there are so many factors that impact our ability to stand on two feet. And when you think about it, when we start to walk, that means we've got a balance on one leg while the other leg is going through swing phase. And you heard my colleague Lacey do a wonderful job talking about weakness and spasticity that gets in the way of advancing that leg forward. But we have so many other systems in our body that are active as soon as we go from supine to sitting. We have some patients, right, that can't even statically sit. And many times that inability to statically sit, sit is more because of posterior pelvic tilt from spasticity, weakness <laughs> of the trunk. Something, sometimes it's from significant brainstem lesions which can really impact their balance. So balance tends to be one of the most more complicated areas, but one that when accurately diagnosed with what the problem is and then treated with rehab, we can make some pretty significant improvements and keep our patients upright, mobile, and, and safe. So um, we're going to talk about, um, obviously, our patient's ability to maintain activity and participation. And a big part of that is ambulation. If I have problems with my balance, I'm going to be slow to get started. I'm going to be slow to move from sit to stand. Once I'm standing, I'm probably going to get my balance for a minute before I think about starting to initiate gait. I not, might even be looking for a wall or something that I can put my hand on to help me as I start to initiate gait. So I'm hesitant to move. I'm not going to take big steps. I'm going to be very slow and deliberate in every movement I make. I'm going to be overly conscious. I'm not going to move my head at all. Heaven forbid I should try and scan the environment because then I'm going to get a lot of visual stimulation. I'm going to get a lot of cervical stimulation. Sometimes we forget about the cervical spine. I'm going to activate my vestibular system in addition to my visual system. Uh, stiff movements, decreased head movements. I'd rather have two feet on the ground than one, feet, one foot because then I've got better balance. Increased stance time bilaterally and then I'm going to have that very typical wide base of support because this is steadier than walking with a more normalized gait support. All right, so here's what we've got to think about. You have to do a differential diagnosis and balance. You can't just assume that because the patient has weakness and spasticity, that is the underlying impairment for balance. We have to be thorough and make sure that there's nothing else going on that could be contributing to that person's inability to maintain an upright posture. So this is what we're going to talk about today. You already heard a wonderful discussion on uh, musculoskeletal, especially related to weakness and spasticity. I'm going to make a couple comments about cervical spine because C1, C2, and C3, those nerve roots coming out of the spinal cord, they go directly to the vestibular nucleus in the brain. The vestibular nucleus in the brain stem is receiving the information from the inner ear about where our head is in space. So if our inner ear is saying, your head's here, but because my neck is like this, because I have weakness and scoliosis, and my neck is saying, no, you're not really there, you're here, there's confusion. And the vestibular nucleus then can't give out the right signal to the rest of the brain about where I am, and I start to have imbalance problems. So cervical spine is going to be a factor. Uh, cerebellum, obviously cerebellum is a huge area for regulation of balance and coordination. And then somatosensory, many of our patients have decreased sensation in their lower extremities or altered sensation that will make it difficult for them to uh, uh, be safe in single leg stance. Then that visual system, we got to look at patients who maybe have weakness in eye muscles that their eyes aren't moving symmetrically. They may have, and I think Lacey alluded to this, the INO, internuclear ophthalmoplegia. We'll look at that and talk about what should we be doing in that to help with the patient with uh, balance dysfunction. Uh, the smooth pursuit saccades, and then uh, the vestibular ocular reflex, which 
we test just to make sure that that connection between the vestibular system into the brain stem up to the muscles that control eye movement is in fact intact. Frequently that is a problem with multiple sclerosis, especially if, especially if they have lesions in the brain stem. All right, so, so <laughs> you saw Andy already. Uh, Andy has been with us, as uh, Lacey alluded to, a long time, so you saw his gait. So hip hike, circumduct, uh, no arm swing on that left side. He presents predominantly like a hemiplegic. We did take the cane away from him, uh, guarding him closely, and then you really see how bad that weakness and spasticity is, which then causes him to lose his balance. So weakness and spasticity can get in the way of balance. So we're going to treat the weakness and spasticity, but we should be thorough and comprehensive and make sure nothing else is going on. So we pulled up another new patient for you, just for a little variation. Now we'll pull, yep. So here's Mike. <coughs> Mike also has a hemiplegia. We just took his cane away, but Lacey's guarding closely. And as he walks, he actually loses his balance. So he has weakness and spasticity in his right leg. He's got spasticity in the gastroc soleus and that spasticity is so overpowering, he can't activate his anterior tip, so through swing phase, he catches his foot and actually starts to lose his balance having to grab for the wall. So in his case again, looks like we're gonna treat the weakness and the spasticity. We might be dialoguing with the neurologist about medical management, but we still can't rule out that there's nothing else going on. So we need to be comprehensive. So uh, the cerebellum is a huge area where we have um, uh, lesions and you can see this massive lesion here. So here's your pons. This huge white area here is a massive lesion from the pons into the cerebellar pedal go out into the cerebellum. And again, the cerebellum, cerebellum is gonna give us a lot of control of balance as well as coordination, the cerebellum also stores a lot of motor programs about how we move. So those automatic programs can be interrupted. Here's more look at the brain stem and you see these gray areas here, those are all lesions within the brain stem area. We don't always see these MRIs. We don't know where the lesions are, but our clinical examination should help us to be able to identify where those demyelinating lesions are so that we come up with the correct underlying impairments that are contributing to the movement dysfunction so we address the impairments in the movement dysfunction and help our patients be safer and more independent mobility. Here's Michael, very different gait now, right? So he's on a four-wheeled rolling walker, he's forward flexed, he never really hits heel strike. He kind of lands foot flat. He doesn't really accelerate or push off. Look at this turn. It's almost like his feet are nailed to the floor. He has significant difficulty uh, picking his legs up. He's got a lot of visual feedback towards his feet. He's not looking up at all with where he's going. And as you can see that walker moving, he's having horrific problems with balance. So Michael was diagnosed at the age of 25. That video, I think he was about 48, 50. So he'd been living with MS for an awful long time. He in fact was, um, being from Buffalo, Dr. Larry Jacobs, um, the neurologist who developed uh, Avonex, one of the first uh, injectable medications uh, for multiple sclerosis. Uh, Dr. Jacobs, when he was starting his research in MS, he actually was injecting the medication directly into the CSF to see how it would impact the disease process. Michael was one of the subjects in that early research work by Dr. Jacobs looking at the effect of Avonex on trying to control multiple sclerosis. 
So he'd been living with MS a long time and unfortunately had that progressive form of the disease. But because he was so um, focused on exercise and keeping his body as healthy as possible, he really was very independent and functional for several years. This was at the later uh, stage of his multiple sclerosis where he was much more limited. So his lesions in, in this picture would make us suggest that maybe there's spasticity because he's kind of on the ball of his feet all the time, right? He's not picking up his foot, so maybe there's weakness of the anterior tip. But that walker, he's leaning on it like crazy, and he's got this kind of movement going. So you've got to su suspect that there's more from a sensory perspective deficit that he has contributing to his dysfunction. So again, from uh, the, the perspective of problem solving, we've got to think about strength, range of motion, absence of spasticity. We've got to think about the cerebellum. We've got to think about somatosensory. So ascending information coming up the dorsal column. So we know where our feet are in space. We have good proprioception. We have good kinesthesia. Uh, information goes from the spinal cord right into the cerebellum. So we get direct information. We get information coming up from the spinal cord right into the vestibular system. So we're getting a lot of information. So there's this constant processing of information from our peripheral somatosensory system into the central nervous system. And that helps us have an awareness for uh, limb position, sensory awareness of the environment through the feet, so whether you're walking on a firm surface, gravel surface, sand, and then I mentioned that cervical spine. So Michael's posture like this, head down, he's getting more distorted cervical information about where his body is in space, which unfortunately is not helping. So the components of balance and dizziness, the vestibular system, so we have the vestibular cochlear nerve that's going to go to the brain stem. And that's important because we're going to talk about the eye muscles in the brain stem, cranial nerves 3, 4, 6. So vestibular can have some information going to ocular motor control. Uh, the visu uh, it also goes from the vestibular system directly to the cerebellum. Then visual, so we've got 3, 4, and 6 are going to control eye movement. Frequently, we see weakness in eye motility, and we'll see a video of that, an eye and O. And if one eye's processing this information, but the other eye is still processing this information, that's going to give distorted visual feedback to our brain about where our body is in space. And then, of course, we have proprioception coming from the lower extremities, as well as kinesthesia. That's going up to the cerebrum, as well as the cerebellum. And then again, don't forget about that cervical spine. Just because the individual has MS doesn't mean they couldn't have some other type of musculoskeletal problem going on that's also contributing to their imbalance. They could, they could have BPVV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, which is the most common type of dizziness. So we always have to be thorough and comprehensive and don't always say, oh, it's the MS, because it might not be the MS. It might be something different. So this is just a slide uh, looking at that peripheral vestibular system. So here are the semicircular canals, the cochlea, and here's um, the vestibular nerve starting to go in, and scarpus ganglia is where the cell bodies are, and then that vestibular nerve is going to go in and um, get synapsed into the vestibular nucleus. And then this is where information gets processed within that brainstem of most importance to us is the vestibular nucleus. And you see that here in the purple, right there. Here's the trigeminal nerve coming in. And then we have the MLF right there, the medial longitudinal fasciculus. That's going to be of importance in the brainstem area because that's going to communicate with a lot of the neurons in the brainstem. And patients with MS will frequently have demyelination of the MLF, the medial longitudinal fasciculus which is going to interrupt this visual processing information and cause more dysfunction in their balance. We can't fix that, right? There's nothing we can do to address the demyelination of the MLF, but if that means that every time they move their eyes, if I look to my left and my left eye starts, but my right eye lags, maybe when I tell my patient to turn their head, 
instead of their eyes leaning the way I might say, you know what, keep your eyes in midline and turn your head so we're not asking for that ocular motility of the eye. We're trying to keep their eyes in midline and decrease some distortion that might be coming from that weakness. And there's a little key to the previous slide, so if you're looking at uh, some of the other information there. So ocular motility, eye movement, so that's cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6. Ocular motor, trochlear, and abductions. I mentioned that MLF, very important in the brainstem area, especially for visual uh, motility. Distorted visual input created by abnormal movements of the eyes, either nystagmus, right? Some of our patients, you look at them and their eyes are just going like this nonstop. So that's spontaneous nystagmus. That means the environment that they're looking at is like this, right? And then we say stand up. So we can't stop the nystagmus. So that patient is probably going to need some added proprioceptive feedback from the hands, something else to compensate for this constant motion of the eyes that is going to give distorted feedback to the brain about where the body is in space. <coughs> then we have the INO. Uh, Lacey started to allude to this. So the INO is a lesion in that medial longitudinal fasciculus where we have weakness of the eye motion. So we'll see a, a video of that next. If you have an INO, this impacts sensory perception not only visually to the brain, but also to the vestibular system, which causes more balance dysfunction. So there are so many connections within this brainstem area for balance. Um, you know, first we got to rule out the weakness and spasticity. Then we got to rule out cerebellum. You know, is it problems with coordination? Is it problems with overshooting? Is it intention tremor? Is it dysmetria? Is it problems with alternating movements? We rule out cerebellum. Then we say, okay, maybe something's going on in the brainstem. Let me do a good ocular motility assessment. Let me see if there's nystagmus. Let me see if there's an I and O because that helps guide us in how we're going to establish their balance retraining program. So here are the eye muscles. So ocular motor, you see, does a lot of work. It controls the medial rectus, the inferior oblique, the superior and inferior rectus. The trochlear is going to control the superior oblique, and then the abductions is going to control the uh, lateral rectus. And this is just a slide showing um, where some of those key areas are. So here's uh, trochlear. Uh, you see ocular motor up there and abductions over to the side uh, within the brainstem area. And then, of course, here's the cerebellum, uh, cerebellar peduncle. So the cerebellum would be sitting out here, sending a lot of information into that brainstem region. And we take for granted, right? our balance system. We really don't have an appreciation of how complex the balance processing is until you have a patient that has a deficit and they're coming in and they're, you know, they're walking and hanging onto the wall with this wide base of support and they don't want to go into single lane stance. And then we start to think about all the different physiological feedback that comes to the brain to help the patient be upright and able to be mobile. So the examination of the systems of balance, first thing I like to do is, well, let's rule out that it's not a musculoskeletal problem. So let's do manual muscle test. Let's do passive range of motion. Let's do a quick stretch, make sure there's no underlying spasticity. Then let's rule out that there's not a somatosensory deficit, that the dorsal column's intact. So let's do localization. Tell me where I'm touching you, right? Let's do proprioception. Position the extremity, eyes closed, match it with the other extremity. Maybe kinesthesia, eyes closed, moving the eye, having to match the opposing extremity to make sure that that's intact. Uh, cerebellum, we're going to look at smooth, accurate, coordinated movements. Visual, we're going to look at the patient's eyes moving, following a moving target. Saccades, eyes going back and forth between two targets. And then convergence, we'll be bringing our finger towards their nose and looking for the medial rectus to activate bilaterally so that they can file the, uh, follow the target coming towards their face. And then the vestibular ocular is going to be 
they're going to hold their head still and their eyes are going to stay focused and they're going to move their head at that rate and be able to hold gaze on that stationary target. So the comprehensive exam, uh, again musculoskeletal, so posture and alignment. If, if uh, taking a look around the room, you know, people are in a, in a variety of different postures sitting here and listening. Some people are a little bit reclined back, some people are sitting forward, you know, some people are sitting with their leg crossed. So the posture and alignment that we are, that we're in, is giving constant sensory feedback to the brain about where the head is in space. So posture and alignment is certainly a big problem. For our patients with MS, so many of them do have weakness. So it could be weakness of the cervical thoracic spine, could be weakness of the trunk, could be asymmetry within the trunk because of muscul muscular weakness, could be a functional scoliosis contributing to postural alignment. Um, so the posture and alignment is key. Uh, you got to rule out that that spasticity is not a problem, so passively testing and quick stretch. Proprioception and kinesthesia. Kinesthesia is just they have to match as you're moving the extremities, so we know that they can process that information. Then the cerebellum, asking for alternating supination pronation. You might start with elbows in. That's easier than holding proximal stability in supination pronation. Toe tapping, symmetrical and alternation, alternating for the lower extremity. Accuracy, finger to nose test, uh, uh, rapid alternating movement, and then heel to shin test, which will, that should be a test, not text, <laughs> um, for accuracy, accuracy of movement, rapid toe tapping, re, uh, reciprocal toe tapping. That all tells us about the integrity of the cerebellum uh, to control um, uh, coordinated movement. And then we get into this ocular motility. So we're going to have the patient uh, follow our moving finger, and we're going to look at their ability of their eyes to follow the pursuit of the moving target. So typically we'll go side to side and make sure both eyes are working symmetrically and following that moving target. Then we do tend to do like that big H, so they got superior gaze, inferior gaze, then we'll do saccades, and saccades is where you're likely to pick up the I and O. So the saccades, you've got your fingers about 12 inches apart, and the patient is looking to the left, looking to the right, back and forth, and you're looking for symmetry of eye movement, that one eye is not lagging. If one eye is lagging, even for two seconds, if this eye's lagging, this eye's looking here, this is a little bit slow. This eye's already processing this information. This eye's still processing this information, and the brain gets confused. So that I and O can be a big factor in balance dysfunction in MS, and it's a lesion of the MLF. So here's Dan. So we're going to look at his eyes. So we're doing smooth pursuits first. So watch his eyes moving. They look fairly symmetrical there, right? Smooth pursuits. Here's superior gaze. Here's inferior gaze. That looks pretty good. Now we're going to go to saccades. What happens with saccades? Whoops, convergence first. So bringing the finger towards the nose, both eyes a deduct. Now saccades. Now watch the eyes. Do you see the asymmetry? See the lag moving into the Adduction, he's got a bi bilateral I and O. He doesn't have a unilateral, both eyes are off. So that means if he's walking and he's head scanning, and as he's head scanning, his eyes are moving, he's going to get a lot of distorted information about where his body is in space. That's VOR, so he holds gaze and he's moving his head side to side. That's okay. But it's more when he's got to shift his eyes, bilateral motion at the same time, that that's going to throw off his balance. So here he's walking, perfect timing, Jen. No head scanning. Look at balance is great. At least he's not even anywhere near him. 
Now we're going to do head scanning. Starts to walk. Now he looks to the right, looks to the left. Ooh, drifting a little bit there. Makes his turn. Going to do head scanning going back again. He looks. Ooh, a little bit of drift. And bigger drift. Almost hits the door. That's the INO. Throwing his balance off. Because as he's moving his head, as he's moving his head, he's getting a ton of information. Right? He's getting cervical information because he's got to move the head. He's getting vestibular information because the vestibular system's turning on as he's moving his head. As he moves his head, his eyes, here's VOR, and this is an ambulation VOR, so that's a pretty high level test. If he's holding gaze, even though his head is moving, his eyes aren't moving, he's holding gaze, his balance isn't bad. But this is really a lot of complex processing going on in the brain to tell the brain where our body is in space to keep us upright and not have us walk into doorways. That's the, just a shot of the ambulation VOR. That's a higher level test. So the INO is characterized by abnormal horizontal ocular movement with lost or limited adduction in the ipsilateral eye and a horizontal abducting nystagmus of the contralateral eye. Dan didn't have the nystagmus in the contralateral eye, and I think part of that is because he has got a bilateral INO. Someone who has a unilateral INO, we tend to pick up that nystagmus a little bit more. So these signs result from lesions involving the medial longitudinal fasciculus and may be either unilateral or bilateral. The ocular motor deficits in MS include the INO and nystagmus resulting in double vision, oscillopsia, oscillopsia is where they feel that the environment is moving, uh, blurred vision, as well as uh, reading fatigue. And then, of course, as you just saw, uh, it throws his balance off when he's ambulating and head scanning. So can you imagine Dan trying to cross a street? So he's got to cross the street, and he's trying to worry about traffic. So he's starting to cross. Maybe he's got to also step down a curb. So he's got a little bit more challenge with balance. And then he's, you know, he's scanning in order to see whether or not there's traffic coming, and he's getting this distorted visual information. So here's the VOR. So let's all do this for a second. Just stick your thumb up in front of your face, arm's length. Keep your eyes on your thumb. And you should be able to move at 2 hertz per second, so almost about 112 revolutions per minute. So you've got to go at this rate. So try that. Eyes on your thumb and move your head back and forth. Some of you are going a little bit slower, which might su suggest that your brain doesn't want you to go faster because it'll feel distorted and off balance. But also think about your neck while you're doing that. Did you feel a lot of activation in your neck? So we're holding gaze. We're doing on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, both ears. But that head motion is also controlled by the upper cervical spine. That's what's moving your head. So C1, 2, 3 are going to that same vestibular nucleus that's giving information from your ear in your brain stem that's telling your brain where your head is in space. So this is again where when you've got a balance problem in MS, because those demyelinating lesions can be anywhere within the central nervous system, we have to be comprehensive. Just because they have weakness and spasticity, don't write off everything else. Don't assume what, ah, it's weakness and spasticity. You know, make sure you're thorough and you check everything so we put together a comprehensive program for the patient. So here are some standardized gait measures that we should utilize uh, with our patients. So you should see that there's some redundancy, especially the time 25 would walk, right? That's the standard uh, for, for MS. So weakness and spasticity, we're going to use that time 25 foot walk. Uh, we can also use the timed up and go. The dynamic gait index uh, we can use, that's going to be uh, that eight or 10 items, at least, DGI, 12 eight items um, that we can have the patient do that's going to challenge their balance while they're walking. Uh, we can do a six-minute walk test or two-minute walk test. That'll tell us something about endurance. The two-minute walk test is nicer because it's four minutes shorter than the six-minute <laughs> walk test. Um, and then uh, the MATS WS12, which is a patient self-report. 
uh, balance and ataxia, the same thing. We're going to stay with that standard 25-foot walk. We, again, can do the timed up and go. Um, it's even nicer, not nicer for the patient, but it's, it's more challenging for the patient if we give them a distractor during the timed up and go. And a distractor would be they're sitting in the chair, and you say to them, count backwards from 100 by threes. So 100, 97, 94, and then you say go. So they're counting. So they're very preoccupied, especially counting by threes. And then you say go, and you'll see this hesitation because they're still 94, and you say go, and then they get up out of the chair, walk their 10 feet, turn around while they're still counting backwards by threes. So that's what happens in real life, right? They're thinking about other things while they're walking, which is going to impact their ability to maybe be safe in their walking or be safe in getting out of the chair or returning to the chair. So the time up and go with the cognitive distractor is really an important test to do. It tells us a lot more about our, in, our patient in the perspective of their safety with mobility, especially in the community. There's the DGI again, and then the MSWS-12. So in regards to participation, so activities, you know, to some extent being functional at home, participation is w how are they in the community? So uh, we certainly want to assess their ability for walking on an uneven surface, um, if you are in an outpatient clinic and you have a grassy area near your clinic, taking them outdoors um, or putting floor mats on the floor so they can walk on an uneven surface there. Um, look at their ankle strategies. Um, if they don't have good tone, you saw Andy uh, walking. He would do terrible on an uneven surface because of his spasticity and weakness. Um, it tells you something about their balance as well as coordination. Check out their uh, ability to ascend and descend curbs. Do they have adequate strength uh, for lowering themselves uh, up and down the curb? Uh, they have to be in single leg stance, obviously, while they're uh, changing uh, leg uh, from uh, the curb and down. There is visual perceptual with going up and down a curb. There is the standard speed in order to be able to cross the street. A lot of times we forget to check that. Uh, but that could be a big factor in determining whether the patient is really safe in their community, especially if you live in, uh, we flew out of Toronto to come here from Buffalo, and uh, I kept saying to, to Lacey, Toronto's just like New York City. She goes, no, New York City's worse. <laughs> but, you know, if you've got to cross New York City and you live there with multiple sclerosis, uh, that could be obviously a very challenging uh, uh, process for you. Okay, so then we got to get down to negotiations with the patient because they have a balance problem. We've done our comprehensive examination. We've got a pretty good idea what's going on. We feel that there is definitely some aggressive rehabilitation that we can put in place that will improve their balance. We're not going to fix it, but we can give them strategies that we can improve their balance. If the, they are really eager and they get on a good repetitive program, we know that we can change motor activity in the brain. We know that we can activate silent neurons that can help for other neurons or, or um, tracks that have been impacted by demyelination. So the ability for cortical reorganization is huge, not just in stroke, but in MS. I mean, in stroke, you knock those neurons completely out are gone. In MS, we might be dealing with a slow axon because of demyelination. We might have some, you know, axons and cell bodies that have been destroyed, but a lot of times it's a slowness of the impulse uh, traveling along that axon. So the more that we can put the patient through a motor relearning, motor retraining program, uh, the more likelihood we can improve their overall function. So setting goals, developing a plan of care, you have to sit down and uh, say to the patient, okay, based on my exam, here's what I think we've got going on. Here's what I'd like to recommend that we, we uh, start uh, from a treatment perspective. You got to get the patient to buy into it because they have to practice. They have to practice every day. If they don't practice every day on the balance retraining program, they're not going to make much improvement. Now, when I say every day, it should be at least three to four times a day. 
So you're going to package this little routine. So it's only going to take them 10 minutes to do. But the more they do it, they're going to start to see improvement in their balance. And as they see their improvement in their balance, they're going to have greater opportunity to do the things that they want to be able to do within the community. So OT and PT are critical in helping the patient identify realistic, attainable goals uh, while uh, sustaining self-esteem and hope. But again, the goals must be attainable. Don't set something out there that you're shooting for the stars. Make it something that you feel you can achieve within two to three weeks because then you can say, hey, look at that timed up and go with cognitive distractor. You, you improve by three seconds. And you know, we know that you know, when, you're, when you're walking, you're doing a lot of talking and that's when most of your falls occur, you know, when you're distracted. So attainable, measurable, realistic, and then functionally focused. Help them understand what are those underlying impairments. Uh, most patients can have the appreciation for uh, weakness and spasticity. Most patients don't understand this balance problem, so a lot of times I'll demonstrate for them, and I'll you know put myself in a more challenging posture, and I'll say, you know, see if I try to move my eyes side to side and I do it in one leg stance, see how I keep losing my balance. Well, every time you're stepping, you have to balance on one leg while the other leg is moving. So we have to train in that mode so we can improve your walking. Discuss the importance of exercise in MS specific to the impairments impacting balance. And uh, we don't give them a lot of evidence in regards to a research perspective, but we certainly will say, see George over there in the clinic? When he came in, he was using a four-wheel rolling walker. Now he's using one trekking pole. You know, go talk to George. Let them have feedback from other patients that have had success with your retraining program. Uh, core is key. Um, when you design a program for the patient, make sure you introduce uh, a lot of core stabilization programs. There's not any patient that can't do core work. And core work could be as simple as bridging to unilateral bridging, um, modified side planks, um, uh, quadruped, unilateral, extremity lift and quadruped progressing into a bird dog, quadruped to tall neo, even if you have to use a ball, but you gotta work that core. If you don't work that core, it doesn't matter how much weakness and spasticity you improve upon in your lower extremity, that, that's gonna be enhanced if you ha don't have the core under control. And obviously, as much as possible, um, make, the, make the exercises enjoyable and varied. Uh, we've had um, <clears throat> an exercise program as part of our practice for, gosh, probably over 22 years. And any patient that's done with therapy, we say, you know, come into the exercise program. You know, come in and your, you know, therapists are here, we can help you. It's great camaraderie. There are other patients that are there with MS exercising. We bring our students in, great learning opportunity for the students, and then they can help the patients with their exercise. But we gotta get them bought into doing constant, not constant, but uh, daily exercise to really keep this system strong. So here's Jean on the low mat table. So uh, Jean's got pretty significant um, uh, weakness. She's in a motorized wheelchair. You saw she needed uh, close supervision when she did a lateral transfer. So we're gonna look at her, <coughs> excuse me, sitting balance. So she's got a pretty weak core. See, she's got no lumbar lordosis, right? She's in a posterior pelvic tilt, her shoulders are forward. So she can statically sit. Now Jake, our colleague's gonna do a little dynamic reaching. So she's crossing midline, going the other way, crossing midline. So she's got a real weak core. So in Jean's case, um, we're gonna have to do good old basic mad exercise, right? We're gonna need to get her in prone, we're gonna need to get her prone on elbows, maybe just in prone on elbows some reaching, we're gonna have to do some bridging, we might have to assist her with the bridging in the beginning. So there, there's Lacey in there helping to get her into a supine posture, or excuse me, into a prone posture. So you see prone on elbows, and we would go into the reaching from prone on elbows, then we'd start to get her back into a quadruped position. You know, remember, Rehab's a contact sport, so if she's quadruped, 
I've got my knees on her hips, my hands are on her shoulders, so she's quadruped and I can get her to doing some weight shifting, so we're strengthening her core, anterior and posterior, progressing to getting her arm up. So if we really work Jean's core sufficiently, you know, we should be able to improve that sitting balance and potentially improve other aspects of her daily uh, living. So retraining the system using an assistive device can compensate for balance problems and contribute to the disuse of the system. So obviously we've got to keep our patients safe so that we have to prescribe an assistive device if they're unsafe with their ambulation. But our goal early on in the disease process is retraining and promoting neuroplasticity. So we might say, okay, right now in the community you've got to use that walker. But every time you come into therapy, we're going to be doing higher level activities that we're going to take that walker away and we're going to challenge you. We're going to use a lot of visual focusing in the beginning, and I'm going to use a lot of hand contact in the beginning, giving you some proximal stability. We're going to bombard that brain with a lot of sensory feedback so the brain starts to spill out the right motor program so that you're getting better control of your overall um, EDLs. This is from Dr. Fay Horick, uh, does a lot of research in, in balance retraining. When treating for somatosensory deficits, practicing functional positions and challenging balance while adding visual cues, visual cues, so visual focusing, tactile feedback with finger or hand support and or light weights can assist the patient in retraining. Hands-on contact by the therapist can also help with tactile feedback and reinforcement of the proper performance of the task. So we put the hands on a couple times, then take the hands away put the hands back on a time, couple times and take the hands away. We don't want them to be dependent on it, on our hand support or the visual focusing, but we're going to need to give them that added sensory feedback to start to rewire that system within the brain. So other strategies, you can add light weights to the ankles to enhance proprioception. The visual cues are huge, focus on targets placed at eye level, targets on the floor that you're focusing on. Uh, we've talked a lot already about the cervical proprioception deficit. Um, if they have a lot of problems with cervical spine, decrease the head motion, use the more head and body motion for activation and then visual feedback. Um, this is a website from Cindy Gibson Horn who's done a lot looking at uh, compression uh, for balance uh, feedback and she's had quite a bit of success so you might take a look at her website as well for proprioceptive uh, enhancement. So treatment of ocular motor dysfunction, you're going to retrain it just like any other muscle. So remember, um, whoops, remember uh, Dan, so he had a bilateral INO, right? So we're going to actually get him to move his head with his eyes staying in midline. And when he moves his head, we're going to have him focus and then focus, and then focus. And we might start that in a sitting posture, then we might progress it into standing with one hand support, then we might progress it to standing with no hand support. But instead of him activating that I and O by leading with his eyes and giving the distorted feedback, we're gonna have him move his head and eyes together so we can start to retrain that system. So repeated, we can also do repeated practice of smooth pursuits. So we give them a very small diagram, maybe a small box, and they're just following the box. Then we change, change it into six points, and they're following the box. So just tracking eye movement exercises in low-level positions, so in sitting, then progressing to standing, then to progressing to standing on an uneven surface. So then we're really changing their, their balance. We do the same thing uh, with saccades, convergence. The patients can work on that on their own. I had one patient that her convergence was so bad, her arm wasn't long enough. She couldn't focus here. So then we had to have her sitting at the table, and she'd focus at the picture, and then maybe the next targa was here. And she'd work that distance, and then as that got better, then we could keep bringing the other target closer until we actually could get her to use her, her arm. Key with uh, ocular motility, as really with all exercise, slow down the movement in the beginning, make the diagrams or targets big enough for the patient to keep in focus, um, and then progress their posture. So start seated, then go to standing with a wide base of support, two hand support. So you want to train this ocular motility system. First strengthen those eye muscles, then strengthen the eye muscles in challenging postures for their balance, because then that will carry over 
to their safety and dynamic movement. Repeated practice of the VOR in speeds and postures, so the same type of idea, uh, concept, so they might be looking at their thumb and going very slow to keep that under control. As that system starts to be retrained, then they can start to increase the speed of their movement and then again progress them through different postures. Um, if they have problems with dynamic movements, um, say the patient is moving from a sitting to standing posture, and every time they move from sit to stand, they find, feel like they need something to hang on to. Work on giving them a visual target, so when they push off their t chair, they're focusing on something, and they still have one target to look at, but they're getting more accurate visual feedback because their eyes aren't looking down and then having to shift up. Their eyes are staying focused on a stationary target. And then we can also vary uh, hand support, basis support, uh, holding visual fixation, taking visual fixation away, and then um, even putting them on, on foam while they're doing uh, the vestibular ocular and uh, uh, balance retraining activities. So the, the idea overall is if they have that significant weakness in both eyes, you don't want the eyes moving. You want to hold gaze and do functional retraining with gaze held watching the stationary target. Then challenge the base of support, still doing the same activity with eyes focused. And then start to work on head and eye movements together because we're not going to fix the I and O. That's not going to go away. But we can teach them strategies where they can use their eyes, keeping them more in midline and getting more accurate visual feedback that will improve their balance. All right, remember Gene? Core strengthening. So Gene progressed to standing in the parallel bars on the Wii Fit. She's getting visual feedback from that iceberg thing. What's the, is it the duck? What is it? The penguin on the iceberg. So she's, she's working on the, on the Wii Fit. Can you play that one more time for us, John? She's standing on the Wii Fit in the parallel bars. That's the woman that fell over in dynamic reaching. She's standing on the Wii Fit. She's getting visual feedback of that penguin on that iceberg. She's getting nice weight shifting. Look at that nice posture and alignment. This in and of itself motivated her to come into therapy all the time because she wasn't thinking about what it did for her in a standing posture. She just loved playing that game. <laughs> it was enjoyable for her. She loved trying to keep that penguin on that iceberg. So the more that we can make therapy and exercise you know, interesting for our patients and fun and enjoyable, and maybe you put it at the end of the session so that you say, okay, you gotta do 20 minutes of good core strengthening, then you can go into parallel bars and do the penguin game. Uh, standard scales that you should consider using, uh, certainly the Berg is a huge uh, uh, scale for uh, balance, the timed up and go, dynamic gait index, uh, very good for uh, ambulation challenging, the Hauser deambulation index, the ABC is good uh, for balance, the dizziness handicap inventory if the patient is having more uh, dizziness than uh, true imbalance. So in summary, uh, first thing you got to do is you got to figure out what are the impairments the patient has. If the, the problems are just weakness, then we've got to address the weakness and spasticity. But make sure you clear that ocular motor system. Make sure they don't have deficits in um, ocular motility. You know, you wouldn't know that Dan had an I and O unless you, you, you looked at his eye movements and you asked them to look between two targets. A lot of times we're not doing a comprehensive enough examination to determine what are the underlying problems contributing to the balance dysfunction. The patient has problems with VOR, holding that gaze while moving the head side to side. We gotta practice that. We'll start in sitting. We might start with this slow of a motion, as long as they can keep that target still, and then as that gets better, you start to increase their speed. Then you start to change their position from sitting to standing with two hand support to one hand support to no hand support. Then you get them walking and doing a VOR. You know, that's when you know you've really retrained the system. And all of this is possible in MS. You just got to start at the level that the patient is able to tolerate and practice. And as the patient repetitively practice, you start to retrain, uh, excuse me, you start to reactivate neurons in the brain that can take on uh, this particular activity.